Hey, Brian. So um, I'm here with Brian Hughes, uh, my friend and colleague. And so Brian has a new book out in the last couple of months about um, uh, sort of a history of, of psychology. And so I want to talk about that a bit and then also how it relates to the topic that we've both been interested in for a while. Um, so why don't you just give us kind of an overview of what what the book's about and why why you decided to write it? What was the sort of the need for it? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the book is, is it's kind of like a history of psychology, but it's a bit more than that. It's also a discussion of the politics of psychology. And it's based on concepts rather than the cliched great men narrative uh, that people often use to describe history. Um, now, I talk about some famous psychologists like Freud and Skinner, but I'm really talking about kind of the hysteria around Freud and the kind of politics of Skinner rather than you know their individual contributions and so on mm -hmm. my the focus is really on how human beings have tried to explain the human experience throughout history and it, i wrote it because i wanted to get away from the cliches and get away from the exceptionalism in psychology i mean psychology positions itself as a wonderful thing and a force for good in the world and um, I just wanted to take maybe a bit more of a balanced look at things like that and acknowledge the wisdom and the understanding of human experience that we've gained from outside of the scientific uh, psychology and outside of the Western world. So it's, 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 it's just trying to be a, a, a little bit more open and a little bit more balanced in its uh, approach to the story of how we, how we have come to, to view ourselves. So basically, the idea being that psychology didn't start in, you know, as psychology didn't start in the late 19th century, fresh, you know, sure. from ever, and to become what we know today, that there's sort of a, that ancient humans uh, engaged in their own form of psychological exploration, I guess you would say. Yeah, I think that's, I think that would be correct. I think also, um, it's a bit of a cliche to say that history is is is, is important for the present and the future, but if you look at what psychology actually involves, you know, how human beings talk about sexuality, how human beings talk about race, how human beings talk about morality, normal behavior, abnormal behavior, um, how we even talk about logic and reason and autonomy. These are ideas that are relevant to today's life, to today's politics, to our, our, our well-being and our sense of freedom in the world, to democracy. And, and human societies have been trying to explain these things and trying to agree positions on these things for thousands of years. And the idea that a bunch of university academics in the 19th century invented the study of this is, is, is clearly ridiculous. Uh, and they certainly don't own it. And, and um, academics and scientists don't own psychology in this way, or, or, or at least our, uh, our shared understanding of what it means to be human in different respects. What would you say is the overarching um, kind of idea or the one thing, if you wanted people to read it, to come away with uh, from reading the book? Was yeah, that's, yeah, I, I would say, okay, I, people think that psychology is a science, which it is, um, and that it is therefore neutral and balanced and evidence-based, which it tries to be. But I would argue that, that and the, the book tries to capture this in lots of different ways is that what we claim to be our understanding of human experience and human welfare is often skewed by vested interests and by power and 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 and, and, um, and privilege in society so if you take the idea of psychiatry and mental health what we define as you know normal and abnormal behavior is often a way for society to deal with troublesome people, uh, maybe with uh, minority groups in society, maybe with women. You know, we pathologize people's behavior in order to control them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the social construction of psychological concepts in order to preserve power in society, that is a recurring theme that comes up again and again and again in the history of psychology, and it's highly relevant to the present. And that's kind of that, that would be what I would recommend people reflect can, on. Yeah, well, after like can, can you give a, perhaps a historical example of that and maybe a current day example of that? Well, I think historically, say race science, um, uh, the idea that 
we can scientifically you know study different races and draw conclusions about how different races of people differ from each other i mean in psychology this 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 was you know essentially eugenics um and it's essentially pseudoscientific in in most respects you know if you're looking at cultural practices around the world like an anthropologist or something that's one thing but if you're arguing that there are race differences in in in, in emotionality or in cognitive prowess or intelligence a lot of that is pure pseudoscience innate, innate differences innate differences yeah um uh, but the because the genetics um, that are being implied, genetic differences between different groups in society are never the same as what our our, our cultural labels for people happen to be. Um, and so the example of how psychology has dealt with the issue of race is is very much a, a case study in how this type of science tries to, serves the interests of pri the privileged in society. So white people explaining why you know, they are richer and more powerful and more civilized. I mean, that has been a feature of race science for 200 years. It looks very vivid in the 19th century when you talk about these folks going around the world, colonizing countries and so on. Um, but it still exists today. You still have these racial stereotypes, um, you know, discussed in terms of data, in terms of late crime statistics, health statistics and what have you. So, so the, the the legacy of race pseudoscience is 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 a, a continuing problem. So, I mean, like, understanding the history of it helps us understand what's going on today. I mean, the same thing. I would say, sort of, as a, growing up as a gay man, one would see this. I saw the same thing. Obviously, I grew up, um, you know, in a family where it was considered, you know, psychological illness. There was no moral mm -hmm. judgment about it, but it was, you know, middle class Jews in New York. It was, you know, considered a psychological illness. And again, that was sort of the, the powerful force when you're growing up to be told that you're mentally disturbed in some way when all you're really doing is being attracted to men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, you know, the, the pathologizing of, 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 uh, of homosexuality or gay life, you know, that has been going on um, right up to the 21st century. I mean, uh, you know, textbooks published in the, two, with the, the year 2001 still had these kinds of um, tonalities. Mm -hmm. So the books would talk about, you know, you know the, 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 the listing of homosexuality as a, as a mental disease, which is something from the 20th century, would still be described in books in the 21st century as those students needed to know this, you know, that this is historical, it, but it's, it, it's uh, still relevant. Um, uh, so, yeah, those those types of issues keep coming. Another issue there, of course, is most of psychology research is heteronormative. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of our understanding of human intimacy is based on an assumption that heterosexuality is the norm and homosexuality or sexual diversity is um, is, is, is something other than the norm. Um, and uh, it impedes the way in which we scientifically look at people's lives because we assume uh you know the types of sex lives that straight people have are the standard by which everything else has to be compared and that limits our understanding of everything else then and how does this these general themes would you say relate to the topic that we've been <laughs> connected by um you know me cfs or me uh long covid sort of the assumption that these are um uh psychologically generated or psychogenic in some way or psychosomatic um what how does this sort of tie into the your the themes of your book yeah i mean there's a lot there um and i do talk about amy in the book uh in in in, in a couple of places really and i talk about covid as well um you know, one theme relates to how people understand the difference between evidence-based claims and our authority-based claims. So when I talk about COVID in the book, I talk about how argument for, from authority can still be persuasive. Mm -hmm. You know, people will vote and support anti-mask and anti-vaccine politicians, even though they, they are being endangered by those policies. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we live in a modern age, a scientific age, can be an illusion. 
And, um, you know, a lot of the controversies you and I have written about or talked about in the past relate to people who just are kind of, you know, making claims that can't be substantiated, mm-hmm. but they're still believed because they have positions of authority. Well, I mean, that's um, a, that's a relates to what you talked about, uh, uh, eminent... Uh... Uh, um, eminent based medicine, eminent based medicine instead of evidence based medicine, um, and I don't know if you coined that or you can't, did you pick that up somewhere else or did you? No, I, I believe I coined that. Actually, I wrote about it in a book in 2016 on pseudoscience, mm-hmm. and uh, I kind of just recycled it ever since, hoping that somebody will pick it up and uh, and cite me with it. Well, but I, um, I it up, so I'm citing you with it now. Great. <laughs> I also talk about ME in the book uh, more directly. Um, uh, when I talk about um, uh, gender bias in, in medicine. Um, now, I mean, I don't mean to reduce everything down to gender bias, but it's just an example of gender bias that I use um, uh, uh, because a lot of, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, history of, say, psychiatry, mental health, um, you know, involves, you know, privileged voices describing why those troublesome people are so troublesome and often it has been women um and i think we're all somewhat familiar with the ideas around hysteria as a sort of uh, historical example of, of of the psychologizing of physical illnesses um but i also then talk about it uh, emmy as an example of um of the of this problem of psychologizing more generally psychology trying to take over mm-hmm. uh, psychological exceptionalism um, because it's a logical fallacy uh, that if we don't, if we cannot explain a physical illness, it must be psychological. Well, that's and, a, uh, a knee-jerk, a knee-jerk, uh, you know, reality. yeah. And also the issue of of, of that you're promoting a duality or you're promoting a Cartesian dualism. If you sort that's of right. suggest that uh, these things might have a pathophysiological basis, you get accused of you know, not understanding that 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 mind and body are you know are the same or whatever. So, what's up with that? Yeah, I mean, dualism is a, a kind of a recurring theme in the history of psychology, and I I, I do bring it in as well in this case. Um, I mean, if the question was why 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 are people accused of um, being dualist? I mean. Uh, we certainly have that with the ME uh, guidelines and the ME practices. People who who criticize cognitive therapy um, for ME or criticize exercise therapy even are accused of being dualistic. Or uh, you know, and and it's an easy criticism because it sounds like it means something, um, but it's 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 usually very unsophisticated philosophically speaking. It's a philosophical term. So one of the problems with the with the criticisms is that, you know, it's not really what dualism is. Um, the implication is that the patients and the activists are criticizing the therapists because they're they're dualistic. They're engaging in some kind of magical thinking, you know, and that 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 um, that isn't really what dualism involves uh, without getting too technical. Um, modern philosophers would be quite happy with the idea that uh, dualism is a reasonable proposition. I mean, the, the, there has traditionally been a different, uh, two different types of dualism, um, property dualism and substance dualism. Mm-hmm. Um, substance dualism is the kind of the wrong one, you might say. It's the idea that there exists a mind or a consciousness that is not of this universe, but it's magical and it exists and you can't touch it or feel it or prove it. Um, and that's kind of the intuitive dualism that people have about their souls and spirits and living in afterlives and things like this. But the other type of dualism that people scientifically look at or is commonly referred to as property dualism so it's the idea that you have one you know one 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 substance but two properties and that's the real philosophical debate uh, in in the modern world so um we might say something like you know uh, we might debate whether a, a neuron firing in the brain is the same as a human emotion we might say that the neuron firing in the brain correlates with the emotion or causes the emotion, but happiness is happiness. Um, joy is not serotonin and it's not a neuron firing in the brain. Um, you, it is possible to think of things in two different ways. Yeah. That's not dualism. So it can be biolo- there's a biological substrate, obviously, to all these things that's happening yeah. at the same time as you're experiencing something that's kind of 
not you're not just I'm not just experiencing firing. I'm experiencing something that comes yeah. out of that, presumably an emotion or 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 something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and a lot of the you know, this isn't to like praise psychology research. I mean, quite the contrary. In some respects, a lot of brain imaging research is based on a kind of um, uh, an assumption that the blobs that light up in your brain, um, you know, uh, correspond to human experiences and therefore constitute human experiences. But an example I give is that you know, if you if you're embarrassed and you blush and your face goes red, if you're if if you have a light skin tone to begin with. Um, you know, the, the bursting capillaries in your cheek correlate with your embarrassment, but they don't constitute embarrassment. We don't say that our cheeks are the center of, the, of, of, of our embarrassment. You know, it's just a physical thing that happens that correlates with embarrassment. Um, we can feel, embarrassment is a feeling and it's separate to the physical thing that's happening in our body at that time. That's just looking at things in two different angles, two different perspectives, the one property with two two different sorry the one substance with two different properties that's what dualism involves there's nothing magical about it um and there's nothing particularly illogical about it either L just to extend the point to physical health i mean if you break your leg and you've recently broken your foot i hope that's not revealing anything um <laughs> private, <laughs> private matter <laughs> yeah um you know you, you the pain that you experience anyone watching, it's very for anyone watching i have a hairline fracture of the fifth metatarsal and it's healing very well and it's a no prolonged uh, problem so for anybody who's listening okay go ahead i'm sorry yeah no it's really good of you to break your foot just to help me make this point though um because the pain that you experience in, in when when you have that type of injury you know is is a, is a, is, a, is a lived experience it's a psychological experience um, but it's definitely caused by physical damage to your body and it isn't dualist to say so. Um, what would be dualist uh, would be to claim that because it's a psychological experience, we have to use a psychological therapy to, to fix you. And to use cognitive behavior therapy uh, to, to uh, treat somebody who has a broken bone would be, most people would see that as nonsensical. So actually it is the CBT proponents who are being dualist rather than the, the, the patient advocates who are being skeptical of that recommendation. That and in the, ME, yeah, in the ME world, we, we, we have that all the time. We have it people- back, It does seem a little backwards. It's like they're, they're suggesting a, a, a psychological intervention in order to solve a somatic problem and arguing that anybody who has a different solution is being dualistic. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they're so, claiming that- because they're connected, they're claiming that they're not dualistic because they say that the mind and the body are one. They're claiming that the, of course, and, and nobody disputes that psychological interventions could be helpful. That's sort of the issue. It's like, just, be, and all, just because someone can have some symptoms that are generated, you know, that are related to emotions, doesn't mean that every single thing that you don't understand is generated in that same way. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, causes don't necessarily lead to cures in every case anyway. Um, uh, you know, you might have an ear infection that caused you to fall over and break your bone. Um, but treating the ear infection might stop it happening again, but it won't fix the bone in your leg. Uh, so the cause of the injury isn't always the root to the cure. Uh, you still need treatment for your broken bone. You need painkillers and you need something to reset the bone and, and allow that um, uh, tissue to heal. Uh, so fixing the broken bone is always going to be different um to the psychological experience caused by the broken bone but the, you know you're right the psychological experience is still important and psychotherapy can be helpful in addressing you know the the, the emotional pain but it doesn't displace the physical treatment and the necessity for physical treatment so so i think the whole dualism thing is a bit of um it's a bit incoherent uh, it's often contradictory and it's it's kind of dated um it doesn't reflect modern philosophy not that that's terribly important to most people but you know it's worth making the point because they're 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 claiming a kind of an authority in philosophy when they use the term dualism, but they they usually use it incorrectly, um, and and they're often blind to the irony as you as you pointed out that you know um, you know, at the end of the day psychological processes are just a set of processes, you know they they sit alongside cardiovascular processes, hormonal processes, digestive processes. 
you've got a whole bunch of processes there and the idea that there's psychological on one side and all the physical ones belong together that's a, that's that's a dichotomy that's dualism that's their position not ours we are coming to the end of our 40 minute zoom session so i'm going to end the recording here um and thank you hold on let me find this i always have to um find where the oh, recording ends